All right, we've been uh, in this class going over uh, kingdoms of Israel and Judah, and we've covered two of the, main, the first two kings so far, and today we're going to get into Solomon, third king of Israel. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, we uh, spent a lot of time so far, two months plus, looking at Saul and David. And uh, of course, with David, we saw him having a great start. He kills Goliath. And he surrounds himself with uh, very strong men, uh, warriors, great warriors. We looked last week, even at the end of uh, 2 Samuel, at uh, some of his warriors. Uh, you know, killing, killing a, a giant Goliath with a slingshot, no problem. Uh, killing 800 in a field, no problem. And, and just keep right on. Killing a lion in a pit, no problem. Okay, and on and on and on. These, these guys, every one of them were great warriors, including their leader, David. Uh, killing 200. And the king asked for 100 Philistines dead. David says, I'll give you an extra 100. Okay? They're led by a man who is of the same breed. <laughs> you know, crazy. Uh, a little bit off the wall there. Uh, a little out of his mind, I think. But, so anyway, those are some of the things as far as David and his, and his military might. Of course, he uh, established a capital at Jerusalem. As soon as he became the king of all of Israel, he moved to the land or to the, to the city of Jerusalem, captured it. And the Bible tells us a little bit about how he captured that. And there's still plenty of evidence of that today. Uh, you can go over there and you can see the tunnel. Uh, I've looked down the chute where uh, they climbed up the uh, about a 40-foot uh, chimney, and on and on. You can see these things. They're still there. They don't have the name David written on them, but uh, we know that that's where it was, and there's plenty of evidence to back that up. And on and on. So uh, he established a military and a political capital, and then he also established a religious capital at Jerusalem. Uh, he... He, he brought the center of worship to Jerusalem. Now, for some reason, Solomon, as we'll see today, Solomon still had uh, religious ties, spiritual ties, to Gibeon. Uh, when he made the great sacrifices at the beginning of his reign, and God gave him wisdom instead of riches at first, uh, we see that happening at Gibeon for some reason. I don't understand exactly what the reason was or why he didn't just stay there at Jerusalem, but that's what happened. Um, but anyway, so Jerusalem becomes the center of the nation. It becomes the, the, the focal point of, of all things religious, political, militarily. Um, that's the center point now of the nation of Israel. Okay, later on in David's life, we see a lot of problems uh, real problems, mostly in his family uh, because of uh, several reasons. Mostly, I think, because of David's sin with Bathsheba. And not only did that cause a lot of loss of respect in the family and in the nation, but it also, I think, in some ways made David discouraged or he quit trying. And you see his sons after that being, I mean, huge rebels and losers, really, Adonijah and, and Amnon, uh, kind of people that you would never want to be around or to have your kids hang around. Um, so these are, these are the family of David, real rotten people, terrible people. And David raised them. And, and you can't argue with that. You know, you're, the proof of what you've done in your life always comes out in your children. It just does. It comes out in your children. And so, uh, I mean, the Bible's very clear on that. And, you know, you reap what you sow. We heard a great message on that last night. You reap what you sow in your family more than anything. So, very, very uh, important to understand. As great as David was, he made a lot of big mistakes, committed a lot of sins, very open sins, and it destroyed uh, the influence that he had as a king and as a father, for sure. Okay, that brings us then, well, let me uh, lastly address. Uh, we, we also talked about David and him establishing, he wanted to build a temple for the Lord, and the Lord said no. So he didn't sit there and do nothing 
for the next however many years, we see him gathering materials for the building of the temple. And we talked about the gold and the silver and the stones. He had stones cut to, to size. And we're not, you know, I did like this. These are not the size of the stones, okay? They're huge stones, uh, big as this room. And many, many of those uh, that he had cut to size, perfectly shaped and perfectly cut, for the temple, and I'm convinced also for, the, for what would be the temple mount later on. Okay, that brings us then to Solomon, the next king of Israel, David's son. Solomon is the son of David and Bathsheba. And so we're going to start into the story, the, uh, the life of Solomon, the kingdom of Solomon. Let's pray and we'll get going. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Help us as we look into your word to learn from it. God, I pray that we'd never be, uh, have our eyes covered over with just thinking that a person is great because of one thing or two things in their lives. Lord, help us to take the whole picture into account and to learn from it and not just uh, be blinded to a couple little things. I pray that you'd help us to, to know the truth and to understand it and to learn from it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, we see uh, in the first couple of chapters, we're going to move now to 1 Kings. In the first couple of chapters of 1 Kings, we see uh, Solomon's promotion to the throne, his promotion to the throne. <clears throat> He's a, a young man. Uh, the Bible doesn't tell us how old he is, but he's, I've, I've often heard that he's probably about 20 years old. He's a young man. And uh, he gets promoted to be the king of all of Israel, Solomon, the son of Bathsheba. Now, again, I don't have the, the time to go through every single verse and so on. But you see David becoming very, very old in, these, uh, in this first chapter, especially. Uh, he's towards the end of his life, and he obviously has a lot of health problems. And I don't know exactly what it was, but he couldn't retain heat. And he should have just plugged in his electric blanket, you know, and he'd have been just fine. Who has an electric blanket? Somebody. No, anyway, it's one of the guys in the dorm. Jordan, I always see his electric <laughs> blanket. Um, so, but anyway, David couldn't retain heat, and so he has to have help. Literally, someone to help him stay warm. Uh, he's an old man and has health problems. And... Um, so the people in the palace, <clears throat> in the court, start to realize that David's about to go and that he's about to pass away. And so it's time to get the next person in place. <clears throat> and so uh, Nathan, the prophet, verse number 10, Benaiah, the mighty men, and Solomon are on the side of Solomon. Adonijah is uh, one of the sons of David. Verse number five tells us he's the son of Haggith. That's the, the, his mother, uh, one of the many wives of David. <clears throat> Adonijah exalts himself, and he has his followers. Uh, let's see here who he gets to follow him. Um, now, it's interesting. He does this secret in secret from David. Anybody who follows this, this Adonijah would have understood what he's doing. Okay, if you don't tell the king what you're doing, obviously it's a secret. And so obviously you are trying to get away with something. At least it didn't look good, <laughs> you know? So let's not give these guys the benefit of the doubt who join with Adonijah and say, well, maybe they just didn't know. Maybe they were tricked or deceived. No, they weren't deceived. Look at what he does, verse 7. Oh, sorry, back up. Verse 6. Here it tells us what Adonijah was like. And his father, that'd be David, had not displeased him at any time in saying, Why hast thou done so? Whew. At any time. Now, we don't know when the story of Bathsheba takes place in the life of David. I would imagine it probably happened around the time, <clears throat> uh, I'm sorry, about halfway through his 40 years. Because Solomon is a, is a grown 
man, well, if he's about 20 years old, a young man, that's typically what they say because of, of uh, Solomon being the age that he is, it'd have to have been about halfway through David's reign when the story of Bathsheba happens. This is the son of Bathsheba, and he's about 20 by now. And Adonijah also is a young man of probably about the same age. Okay? Which, anyway, that's the reason they say, you know, that's why he didn't rebuke him. He felt bad. He said, well, how can I tell my son to do something right when I didn't do what was right? So he's discouraged in raising his children. Um, the, the attitude, let's see here, the attitude that Jonathan had. And the attitude that David had. Remember when Jonathan stepped out at Michmash? He and his armor bearer, they went up the hill and they said, well, let's fight the Philistines. And they used the phrase, it may be that the Lord will work for us. David, I think, had the same attitude. He knew and trusted God that uh, God would help him defeat the giant uh, Goliath. But then when it comes to raising his children... Why doesn't he use that same attitude? It may be that God will have mercy on me and on my children. I made this big, I committed this big sin. Maybe God will have mercy and forgive and uh, help me raise my children still. I, I believe God can, you know, <clears throat> obviously God is a God of mercy. He could easily have, have shown mercy here. But anyway, so Adonijah has never been displeased as a child. Uh, that is a spoiled brat right there. Whew. Uh, any child who has never been told, what would you do that for? Or don't do that. <laughs> I want to get my way. Uh, I was at the store the other day. Oh, this is always, we know this. And uh, this mom and her son, and she sa he said, can I get so-and-so? And she said, no. And he said, please. And she said, no. And he said, please. And she said, no. And he said, please. I, it went on for like two or three minutes So when I'm standing there in the line ready to check out. Please, no. Please, no. Please, no. Please, no. Back and forth. And as soon as they walked out, the cashier looked at the lady in front of me and at me, and she said, wow, my kids never would have dared do that, <laughs> you know. Um, I said, yeah, thank you. That's very good. I'm glad you realized that. Um, wh why can't we just say no? People need to learn. We all need to learn. No, it's good for us, right? Certain things. Sometimes I do it just for my children just because they need to know. No, there's no particular reason they can't have something. You know, they're not asking for a grenade. Okay, they're asking for something simple. And I just say no. And I wait for them to respond. And if they respond, they're going to get in trouble. Why? Because they don't argue. No means no. That's the end of it. He'd never been displeased. Verse 7, what does he do? He conferred with Joab, the son of Zariah, and with Abiathar, the priest. Oh, yes. Now, what's he done? Think about who he contacted. He's trying to set himself up with two uh, powerful guys. Okay, Joab, leader of what? The host. The military, the host. And... And Abiathar, the religious leader, the high priest, as we would call him. Okay, so he's, uh, he's organizing himself with the military leader and the religious leader. And, of course, he would be the political leader. <clears throat> and they, following Adonijah, helped him. But Zadok the priest, Benaiah, and Nathan the prophet, Shimei and Rei, the mighty men which belonged to David, were not with Adonijah. All right, so he's trying to split the country again. <clears throat> All right, here's, here's a plot then by Adonijah <clears throat> trying to steal the kingdom. Spoiled brat Adonijah. <clears throat> All right, here comes then the counterplot, and secondly, by Nathan, a counterplot. <clears throat> Excuse me. Nathan goes to Bathsheba and says, uh, I thought King David said that uh, Solomon was going to be the king. And she said, yes. And Nathan said, listen, I just heard that, that Adonijah is going to try to set himself up as a king. He's planning a big uh, feast to where he's going to proclaim himself king and they're going to set the whole thing up. 
Can you do something about it? And so Bathsheba goes in to King David and, uh, you know, convinces David. <clears throat> Verse 15, Bathsheba went in unto the king into the chamber, and the king was very old, and the minister, Abishag the Shunammite, minister unto the king. Bathsheba bowed and did obeisance, and she said to him, My Lord, thou swearest by the Lord thy God unto thine handmaid, to me, I'm your wife, your favorite wife, <laughs> she calls herself his handmaid, saying, Assuredly Solomon thy son shall reign after me, and he shall sit up on my throne. Now behold, Adonijah reigneth. All right, so here's the counterplot. So Nathan and Bathsheba try to counter this uh, idea of Adonijah. And so then I want you to see third, then, the command of David. What did David do in response to this? He brings Solomon out there and uh, promotes David, promotes Solomon as the king. Now, let's talk about Solomon a little bit. <clears throat> uh, I'll tell you some things. We'll point out a few things that, uh, that he does for Solomon. What do we know about Solomon? He's a lot different than David, is he not? He's a lot different. Um, what has Solomon done mil militarily that you know of? Robert? Well, he amassed like, a lot of horses and weaponry. Okay, no, no. But what has he done so far? To this point, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> to this point, nothing, okay? And even when he amasses horses and so on like that later on, he's not the one doing it. He's not the one out there, you know, going to Egypt himself on his own chariot and rounding up a bunch of horses and bringing them back up to uh, uh, Megiddo, where the, where the horse stables were. Okay, this is not Solomon doing this. These are his people. Anyway, he's not himself. He's, let's say that he's 20 years old, just for you know, the sake of, of what we're talking about here. He's a young man. What had David done by the time he's this age? <laughs> okay, where did David grow up compared to where Solomon is growing up? Right? All right, so we're, I'm asking lots of questions. Let's get some answers. What has David done that Solomon has not done by this time? Yes? Killed a giant. Caesar? Killed a lion. So he had interaction. You know, interaction is good. You know, with lions and bears and so you know, isn't that good? Charity, what else? He had to work. He had to work? Well, you mean Solomon didn't? Probably not. <clears throat> David served his father, and Solomon, what? Served. Was served. <laughs> okay, he had uh, servants serving him. Okay, in a lot of ways, he's been, he's been very, what we would think of as pampered. Um, now, let's not, you know, completely run him into the ground. I, I, the, the Bible definitely tells us a lot of good things about Solomon, especially early on in his reign. And Proverbs chapter 31, right? Solomon, it doesn't say Solomon, it actually uses a different name. Well, I'm not going to go over there for a sake of time, but... Uh, he, he obviously had a good relationship with his parents, his mom and his dad. He had a good relationship. Um, I, I do think that he learned uh, and was educated. He was very educated, but he, he just grew up very, very different, which is not unusual. You know, I know that I grew up very different from the way my parents grew up. Uh, and you probably are the same way, but uh, not to this extent. Uh, these are just extremes, in my opinion. You got David growing up with a whole flock of sheep and Solomon growing up in the palace with a bunch of servants taking care of him. So anyway, that's always, I think, interesting. Oh, one last thing is that David knew what it was like to run from the government. Uh, the government, of course, was Saul and his army, David hiding from them. Solomon, all he ever knew was the government. He grew up uh, living you know, a privileged life. He grew up in the palace. He always was a part of the, the, the ruling class, if you will, not uh, a part of the working class. 
All right, so David then brings his son Solomon out and does several things to him here. <clears throat> In verse 33 of the chapter, he has Solomon ride his own mule and bring him down to Gihon, the spring uh, on the side of Jerusalem. We'll look at some things here, some pictures in a minute. So he's going to ride the king's mule. He's also going to be led by David's own uh, authorities, the, the people that David has in place in the government, not Joab or Abiathar, but he's going to have his own priest and his own leaders. He's going to be led by Zadok the priest, Verse 34, let Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet. Ah, oh, there's the difference. Uh, Adonijah had a military leader and a high priest, but he didn't have a prophet. No prophet of God would have stood with Adonijah. Okay. He is Zadok, Nathan the prophet, and Benaiah the general. Okay, so he doesn't have the general of the army with him, but he definitely has the general of the mighty men. Right? Which one would you rather have, huh? Benaiah or Joab? All right, we all know the answer to that one. So he's being led by these leaders in David's uh, palace, David's court. All right, so uh, Solomon is brought out and declared to be the king. <clears throat> uh, let's see here, verse 41. Adonijah and all the guests that were with him heard all the people shouting and cheering and having a big feast. And they said, uh, what's going on? Wherefore is this noise of the city being in an uproar? And while he yet spake, behold, Jonathan, the son of Abiathar, the priest, came and added an idea, saying, Come in, for thou art a valiant man, bring us good tidings. They must be having a party for us. No. Jonathan the answer said, Verily our Lord King David hath made Solomon king. Oops. That's a problem. Now, go down to verse 50. Adonijah feared because of Solomon and arose and went and caught hold on the horns of the altar. And it was told Solomon, saying, Behold, Adonijah feareth King Solomon. Solomon, verse 52, said, If he will show himself a worthy man, there shall not a hair of him fall to the earth. I wish somebody would have told that to me, huh? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But if wickedness shall be found in him, he shall die. So King Solomon sent, and they brought him down from the altar. And he came and bowed himself to King Solomon. <laughs> All right. So uh, for the time being, things calm down. David uh, makes Solomon king, and Adonijah is spared from death for the time being. <clears throat> okay. Uh, let's see here. No, not yet. I'll keep these for just a bit, bit longer. All right, so the promotion to the throne, chapter 1. We've looked at chapter 1. And uh, then chapter 2 is... Oh, the beginning of chapter 2 is David charging Solomon with the throne and with protecting the, the people of Israel as David protected the sheep. I love the comparison that David makes here. Um, that... You're going to take care of the sheep of Israel. You're going to take care of God's chosen people. Uh, there's a real pride that goes with it. And I can just imagine David, you know, kind of cheering up and waking up a little bit from his uh, old age and his uh, bad health and thinking about God's people and giving this charge to Solomon. Then in the, in the rest of chapter 2, we move on to our next main point. So the first main point we looked at is the promotion to the throne. Now I want to look at his, Solomon's program, his program as king. His program as the king. <clears throat> Solomon knew how to run a government. Whew. You, you've never seen anybody with this kind of uh, lavishness, luxury in their kingdom. Obviously, we know what Solomon was like, uh, but he, he really took to this idea. And I know God gave him all this wisdom more than any man, but uh, he really took to this idea of uh, building a, a very strong empire. 
uh, lavish in luxury. Um, of course, he charged a lot for it. <laughs> so it's hard for me personally to completely be, you know, oh yeah, let's go. This is great. You know, all of these unbelievable things. And then, you know, at the end of his reign, everybody says, wow, let's not do that again. <laughs> you know, that was, you know, a little too much work went to our and party. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, I'm kidding. That's, but anyway, so you get to the end of all this. Yeah, yeah. And you're like, wow, phew. Let's not do that again. <laughs> uh, that's exactly what happens with the people of, uh, of Israel when he gets done reigning. I know. It's because of his sin. It's because of uh, him having many wives. It wasn't because of his wisdom and, uh, and uh, praying and so on, sacrificing. All right. First thing he does as king is he removes his enemies. All right. I love this part. Now, from a purely political standpoint, any heathen king would do this. Any heathen king would remove any opposition when he becomes king and establish for himself a strong kingdom. Okay, so that, that's not really fair to just say, well, yeah, he's going to remove all his enemies so that he can establish a strong kingdom for himself. If you look at each of the situations as they come up, he's removing enemies who are, uh, you know, deceivers and liars. He's removing enemies who for many years have been undercutting uh, the kingdom, undercutting David and now undercutting Solomon. I'm thinking specifically of Joab. So I'll give you the four names and then let's talk about each one. Adonijah. Abiathar, Joab, and Shimei. These four he has removed, and most three of the four were killed. Okay, so these four uh, enemies of the kingdom he has removed, and they deserved it. I'm not saying, you know, Joab, I think Joab, he, he always got the raw end of the deal. Yeah. Uh, he always saw these inconsistencies, and then when he tried them himself, he gets executed. <laughs> you know, he stands with Absalom, and Absalom is loved and, and wept over when he dies, and then Joab tries to go against uh, the, the king, and he gets executed for it. So, anyway, it's, it's always a mess. But still, Adonijah, let's look at Adonijah and what happens to him. Um, he does something very interesting. Verse 13, he asked to marry Abishag. She's the woman who had helped David, the king, old king, stay warm. And all he did was said, I think she's a beautiful woman. I want to marry her. She, he actually goes to Bathsheba. Oh, yeah, yeah. Use Solomon's mother to get to Solomon. And Bathsheba, in verse 18, said, Oh, okay, I'll speak for thee unto the king. I'll ask him. Bathsheba therefore went in to King Solomon to speak unto him for Adonijah. Here's mother to son. And the king rose up to meet her and bowed himself down to her and sat down on his throne, caused a seat to be set for the king's mother, and she sat on his right hand. Wow, all this just for this. She said, I desire one small petition of thee. I pray thee, say me not nay. The king said to her, Ask on, my mother, for I will not say thee nay. Oops. <laughs> Oops. I, I, maybe I will after all. And she said, Let Abishag the Shunammite be given to Adonijah thy brother to wife. And King Solomon answered and said to his mother, And why dost thou ask Abishag the Shunammite for Adonijah? Ask for him the kingdom also, for he is mine elder brother, even for him and for Abiathar the priest and for Joab the son of Zariah. Uh, verse 24, end of the verse. Uh, As the Lord liveth, Adonijah shall be put to death this day. Is David or is Solomon overreacting here? <laughs> if he's asking for a wife from the court, why is Solomon so, is he oversensitive? The, the next thing he's going to ask for is the kingdom. Really? What do you think? 
Sorry? If you give a mouse a cookie. Yeah. They'll keep coming back for more. Anyone else? Joel? He's asking for an inch, but he wants a mile. Okay, but why? How, in what way? I mean, he's just a woman in the court. Is it not? Mm -hmm. It's not. Mm -hmm. That's the key. <clears throat> Somebody want to help me out with this? This is not just a woman in the court. Who is Abishag? Think about it. It'd be a concubine. It'd be a right of the king to come. Any, anyone who marries a concubine of the king is saying, I'm like the king. I'm taking over. So the step might be, there might be a couple of more steps before he gets to asking for the kingdom, but he's definitely heading down the path of saying, you know, I deserve, I deserve to marry into the king's, in the king's family. Okay? Now, it's twisted. It's very perverted. It is. I agree. But he's asking, he's ultimately heading down the path to saying, I deserve the kingdom. And, and Solomon figures that out real quick. Uh, I will not say thee nay, mom. Oops. <laughs> now he has to go back and say, uh, no, no. No, that's over the top. I'm putting him to death this day. <clears throat> Verse 25. And King Solomon sent by the hand of Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, and he fell upon him that he died. Obviously, he didn't fall on him. Just with his body. He jumped on top of him. Okay, how about that? Now, what it means is he literally came to him and, and took him down and stabbed him to death. He killed him. <clears throat> All right, verse 26. We see Abiathar the priest. Verse 26. Abiathar the priest said to the king, Get thee to... Oh, and unto Abiathar the priest said the king, Get thee to Anathoth unto thine own fields, for thou art worthy of death. But I, will, but I will not at this time put thee to death, because thou bearest the ark of the Lord God before David my father, and because thou hast been afflicted in all wherein my father was afflicted. Where's Abiathar from? Nob. Nob. Anathoth is also mentioned in, um, in the book of Jeremiah. When the Babylonians were coming to destroy Jerusalem, there's a record there of Anathoth. And it's believed that that's the same place, general area, as Nob. He's basically saying, you go back home where you're originally from. We don't want you around here anymore. <clears throat> Did I get that right, Jeremiah? Somebody looking that up? Oh, I thought somebody was looking that up. So. Okay. All right, so, he, uh, so Solomon thrust out Abiathar from being priest unto the Lord that he might fulfill the word of the Lord, which he spake concerning the house of Eli and Shiloh. Interesting. Zadok, the other priest, is not of the family line of Eli. If you can understand, <clears throat> the Levites... Uh, part of the, of the Levite family is the family of Aaron. And it was Aaron's family that, were of the, that was the priestly line. But of course, Aaron had several sons. Several of them were put to death, right, by the Lord. They offered strange fire, Nadab and Abihu. Several others were not put to death, Eleazar and Ithamar, those other two families would have continued on, and um, uh, Abiathar is of the line of Eli. Of Eli, and of course, God said that Eli's family would be cut off. Abiathar is the last priest. Um, the, the priests at Nob were of the family line of Eli. Now, was, was it God's plan to have those people killed? Not necessarily, but at the same time, God said it's going to happen. And of course, Saul was the one responsible for making it happen, even though he didn't realize it. So anyway, uh, Abiathar is the last living priest of the family line of Eli. And of course, he had been prophesied that it would happen. All right, verse 28. Joab, oh yes, he knows. As soon as he hears that Adonijah was killed and Abiathar sent out of town, and who knows what happened to him, you know, in, in Joab's mind, 
Joab says, uh oh, I'm next. Then tidings came to Joab, for Joab had turned after Adonijah, though he turned not after Absalom. And Joab fled unto the tabernacle of the Lord and caught hold on the horns of the altar. And it was told King Solomon that Joab was fled unto the tabernacle of the Lord. Now, Solomon is on a mission. He, he knows that these guys have to be either exiled or executed, one or the other. We've got to get rid of these who are undercutting, subverting authority. And so, of course, Benaiah comes to the, to the tabernacle of the Lord, and there's Joab in there clinging to the horns of the altar. And I went, what's the horns of the altar? <clears throat> the altar was that... Uh usually sat in the center of the tabernacle area and it had, the horns were just this like a, like a half arch that faced outward on each corner okay and what's the significance may I want to add to that were those the chair like they were like cherubims or something? no <clears throat> no the, the brazen altar was the place of the main place of sacrifice and it was out in the front courtyard of the tabernacle and on each of the four corners of the altar was a horn, as they called it. And you said it basically, right, a half arch or even a fourth arch, really. Um, but it was a place of mercy. It was considered to be a place of mercy. That's the key. Uh, and so Joab is going to the horns of the altar and hanging on and saying, I'm begging for mercy. And Solomon doesn't buy it. Solomon said, no, 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 no. Uh, sorry, bud. You know, this is the last time. I know God's a God of mercy, but I'm not a king of mercy, evidently, you know. Uh, we, you've been shown mercy many, many times um, for, for wrongdoing. So finally, uh, <clears throat> let's see here. Verse 29, verse 30. He comes to the tabernacle. Now he goes back to the king and he said, Hey, he wants to die at the horns of the altar. Verse 30, Nay, but I will die here. Beniah brings the word back to the king, and the king said to him, Do as he has said, and fall upon him and bury him, that thou mayest take away the innocent blood which Joab shed from me and from the house of my father. All right, this is Solomon's relative. Which one? How's he related? A cousin, right? What were you going to say? Same thing, very good. He's a cousin. Um, this, would be, this would be weird, you know. Um, I have, you know, I'll just but I have cousins that I don't know. And of course, our family situation is, is different, but I have lots of cousins that I wouldn't know them. If I, re if I saw them, I wouldn't recognize them. And I haven't seen some of them in 25 years. They won't see us. <laughs> He's more like it. But, uh, but, of course, he would have known Joab, but still, it doesn't mean that they would have been close, you know, and had all kinds of ice cream socials together or anything like that. All right, so what does he do? Uh, he goes in and, uh, verse 30, I'm sorry, it's going down, verse 34. So Benai the son of Jehoiada went up and fell upon him and slew him, and he was buried in his own house in the wilderness, and the king put Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, in his room over the host. And Zadok the priest did the king put in the room of Abiathar. All right, and then the fourth one, Shimei, Shimei. All right, it's the next verse. Solomon says, hey, look, man, if we're going to start something, we might as well finish it, right? <laughs> So let's just keep right on going. Shimei hasn't been mentioned in quite a while, but he's always been, you know, a guy that you never trusted. Every time you look at him, you wonder, okay, I wonder what he's actually doing. Uh, I know what he looks like he's doing, but I wonder what he's actually doing. Verse 36, king sent and called for Shimei and said to him, build thee a house in Jerusalem. He didn't say, hey, I'm, why don't you think about this? You know, why don't you just kind of stick around town? He said, build you a house in here in Jerusalem and dwell there and go not forth thence any whither. For it shall be that on the day thou goest out and passest over the brook Kidron, thou shalt know for certain that thou shalt surely die. Thy blood shall be upon thine own head. Now there's no question. There's no debate. There's no, uh, there's no deal being made here. This is what you're going to do. And if you don't, that day you're going to die. You understand? Anything unclear about that? Good. 
So it came to pass at the end of two years, I'm sorry, three years, verse 39, that two of the servants of Shimei ran away to Achish, the son of Maacah, king of Gath. Now why are they running away? Because he can't follow them. Because <laughs> <laughs> they say, man, there's no, he can't get out of town, man. He's not going to be that dumb. Ankle bracelet. To lean, yeah, yes, yeah, right. He's got his ankle bracelet on. All right, so Shimei arose, verse 40, and saddled his ass and went to Gath to Achish to seek his servants. And Shimei went and brought his servants from Gath. He brought them back. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, we got them back. It was told Solomon that Shimei had gone from Jerusalem to Gath and was come again. The king sent and called for Shimei and said, Did I not make thee to swear by the Lord and protest unto thee, saying, No, for a certain on the day thou goest out and walkest abroad in it with it, thou shalt surely die. And thou saidst unto me, The word that I have heard is good. Why then hast thou not kept the oath of the Lord and the commandment that I have charged thee with? The king said, More to Shimei, thou knowest all the wickedness. Oh, yeah, now here's the real reason. <laughs> uh, thou knowest the wickedness which thine heart is privy to, that thou didst to David my father. Therefore the Lord shall return thy wickedness upon thine own head, and King Solomon shall be blessed, and the throne of David shall be established before the Lord forever. But you are done. My throne is going to be established forever. You're done. So the king commanded Benai, the son of Jehoiada, which went out and fell upon him, that he died. And the kingdom was established in the hand of Solomon. First order of business, remove the enemies, the undercutters of the kingdom, the subverters. All right, that brings us then to the second main part of the program of King Solomon is his prayer for wisdom. His prayer for wisdom. 1 Kings chapter 3 uh, tells us about this prayer for wisdom. And then 2 Chronicles chapter 1. All right. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to have you take any more notes at this point. I do want to talk about uh, the, the next order of business will then to be beginning the, uh, the building programs. And so... Um, I'm doing this for the sake of uh, all the students that are missing and for you visitors so you don't have to be uh, too bored out of your head today. Um, I have here um, some pictures of some things that, that relate to Solomon and I just want to spend some time talking about them. Solomon was one of the greatest builders in history. Okay, there's, there's no question about that. He, he had a mind not just to build. I mean, he, Solomon obviously knew everything about everything. I mean, that's the way I look at it. He knew everything about science that there was to know at the time and more. He knew everything about people. He understood people. I mean, you read his writings and he understood the fool. He understood the, the rich and the poor. He understood kings and servants. He understood people. What's that science called, by the way? I don't even... Philanthropy. Philanthropy? Is that what it is? Anthropology. Philanthropy is Obviously, some of our students don't understand philanthropy. <laughs> so, but uh, anyway, he, he understood a lot of things. And one of the things he also understood, you know, he understood war and peace. He understood building. Um, he was a great builder. And, and by the way, don't just think of the temple. As great as the temple was, a lot of that was done by his father David. Okay? But he, uh, he also built many other things that were, uh, that were very, very significant for keeping the peace. He believed in the philosophy of speaking softly and carry a big stick. Okay? Which I like that philosophy. Um, he believed that. And, that's, and it's very obvious. I mean, he just fortified everything, made it real strong. And there's hardly any wars that go on in, in, the, in the first 15, 20, 30 years of his reign. The wars and the other countries rising up against him were a result of him disobeying the Lord and having many wives. Okay, this is a, uh, a, uh, an actual place that you can visit in Jerusalem. I think it's in Jerusalem. Um, this is the city of Megiddo up in the, uh, the Valley of Armageddon. Of course, the name Megiddo is one of the major cities there, and then hence the name Armageddon. The, the reason, several reasons I wanted to point this out, 
Um, there's, these are horse stables either here or back in here or both. Um, there's a lot of debate over where they are. I've got some pictures in here also of, of the horse, uh, the stables, what's left of them. Very clearly mangers, holes for tying up the horses and all kinds of you know, holes next to the manger for that in the rock. Anyway, lots of really interesting things. So the horse stables, he had a huge uh, cavalry, they believe, uh, of horses stationed here at Megiddo. Another big uh, feature of Megiddo, and this is a common thing in two other places that, that Solomon fortified, are the gates. He had an elaborate system of gates uh, that you had to pass through before you could enter into the city. And the three places that he fortified, um, do I have that here? Chapter 9, uh, I think it tells us there, verse 15. Yes, it does. Um, the end of the verse he fortified, he raised uh, to build the house of the Lord and his own house and Milo, which that's the, the area, the south end of the Temple Mount. <clears throat> and the wall of Jerusalem, that would probably be the north, the north and the west wall. That was the weakest point in Jerusalem because there's not a natural hill, a valley that leads away from the city. It's just kind of flat. So he had to fortify that to, uh, for protection. And Hazor... Megiddo and Gezer. Okay? He's an old geezer. <clears throat> so, those three cities have all been excavated, the gate systems. They are all exactly the same gate system. Exactly the same. In fact, when they were, when they were digging out Hazor, this is about 12, 13, 14 years ago. I believe. You know what? I'm sorry. This is that I heard the story six years ago. Um, it might have actually been back in the 60s or the 70s, and come to think of it. When they were digging out Megiddo, they said they, they had already dug out Gezer. They had already dug out the gate system at, at Megiddo. And they said if, if Hazor was fortified by Solomon, it has to have the same gate system. We'll find it. And so I forget if it was Yigel Yadin. I believe it was Yigel Yadin, one of the, the famous archaeologists in Israel. Um, they found one wall of the gate, and they understood how it was to be laid out. Yigel Yadin, or the archaeologist that was there, he literally paced off across. He knew exactly if it's 15 feet across or whatever it is. He paced off to the other side where the other wall has to be. And he said, dig down right here. There's another wall here. Hmm. And they dug down, and exactly right there was the other wall. It was built by Solomon. These three cities were fortified by Solomon. And so this gate system is, I have a couple of pictures I can pass that around. This is in the gate system at Megiddo. Okay? They've dug down. Obviously, these would have been much higher towering walls. You walk in there, soldiers on every side in wartime, or any threat at all, and, and they would have been all, you know, these walls are loaded and all kinds of, inside the towers there were different levels of soldiers and so on. To get through the gates was deadly. I mean, that wasn't going to happen. So there would have had to obviously been a different way in if you're going to do it. Okay? So... Anybody want to see this? I can pass this around. Why don't you start one over here and one here. Um, I'll hold that on to this. This is at Megiddo. These are the, the uh, horse mangers, not, sorry, the stable mangers that are there. You, you can see a lot of holes in the rocks. Uh, you can see the actual, I think this is at Megiddo. The ones at Megiddo, might, this might be somewhere else. This might be at Hazor. Come to think of it, I believe that's at Hazor. This is at Megiddo. Um, they're a lot, a lot more organized. But if you go out and you can actually look in these mangers. Uh, sorry, that's, did I give you all of those? I have some personal pictures that I took 
when we were at Megiddo, standing there looking at all these main, just rows of mangers and the same type of uh, holes in the manger and the, on the sides that uh, would have been used to tether the horses. Okay, so there's a few other things there. Um, so he fortified cities. He had lots of uh, building programs, walls to, to really uh, strengthen some of the major cities. Obviously, Megiddo is in a very important place, uh, being on the huge valley of, of Armageddon. Anybody coming through, any major army would have had to pass through there. And so he has a fort there that they can go out from and back in for safety and so on. He also fortified Hazor. Hazor is a huge valley. It's in a huge area of valley next to Mount Hermon. So anybody coming from the north, the Syrians, the Arameans, uh, even later the Assyrians, anybody coming through there has to come right down close to Hazor, and they can use that as a, as a fort to go out from and, and to uh, uh, protect the valley, the entire area. So, <clears throat> and the same with... Uh, uh, Gezer, it's in the, in the Philistine uh, plains. And so uh, the major way of the sea, the road that led from anything up north down into Egypt, went right by Gezer. So anyway, he's protecting all three major areas, north, middle, and the south of the land of Israel. Okay? Besides that, he also... Oh, yes. Megiddo is in the north. It's... Megiddo is kind of the center. It's okay. it'd be in the north is center. This, is this the city that the Babylonians sieged? The Romans. Or was it the Assyrians? There um, was some ancient before the Romans. Because I've seen this exact city with soldiers sieging it. And it was like a recreation of it. I, I guess. So I, it the northern kingdom or Judah? That's the northern kingdom. Okay. Northern I think kingdom. I saw some of the Assyrians. Did, I mean, you know, they, they probably did. did. I don't remember. I don't remember. It would have definitely been a uh, focal point, you know, because it was a fortified place. Yeah. I just don't remember. It's, it makes sense that they would, but I don't remember. <clears throat> Besides that, he also, David built up the city of Jerusalem. That's why it's called the city of David. I say, no. Jerusalem is actually much bigger than the city of David. Okay? Here is a, uh, a map. Now, here's a modern picture of the Temple Mount. And then this, you can see the hill, the Kidron Valley, and then this hill here in the middle called what's called the city of David. So this area up in here is all Jerusalem. This is the little piece. It looks like a tongue. It looks, anyway, but this is the, the little city of David. This used to be a much deeper valley on the left side, the Teropian Valley. And then the Kidron Valley, the Hinnom Valley down here. And so it was a long, somewhat narrow city. Don't be fooled, though. I mean, that's not 50 feet wide. You know, that's hundreds and hundreds of feet wide across here. And it's about a mile across uh, from top to, to bottom. Maybe not a mile, but at least three-quarter mile or something like that. It's very... It's a decent size. The Gihon Spring would be right down here on this side. Later on, the Salom, Pool of Salom would be down on this corner. And Hezekiah's Tunnel uh, went from one side underneath, back and forth, all the way across over to this side. Um, anyway, so uh, what did Solomon do? He expanded. The Milo would be this area up in here and then on up into the Temple Mount. Okay, uh, Mount Moriah, <clears throat> let's say that we're looking at it from this angle, okay? So we're looking at it from the south, looking north. Mount Moriah would be a hill up here. Well, you can't just, it's not very wide at the top. You can't really build a temple right there. So what he did is he built these walls, a retaining wall for this building to stand on, okay? So he built a retaining wall, leveled it off on top, and built on top of that. What's there now is not Solomon's walls. Okay? In fact, the walls that are there now, the tops of the walls were built about 500 years ago. But the base of those walls was put in by Herod the Great. The, the original Temple Mount that Solomon built was much smaller than this, they believe. And there's... You can go under, I can't go underneath. Most people can't go underneath. 
Um, but the Muslims can, some, certain ones. Uh, they don't like the Jews to go underneath the Temple Mount. There's all kinds of tunnels in here. Uh, they don't want the Jews in there because they believe the Jews are trying to steal the Temple Mount, you know, steal. How do you steal what rightly belongs to you? But that's what they, the way they look at it. So the original Temple Mount was much smaller than this. Um, but Herod the Great, he expanded it to the present size. And the, the stones that you can find at the base of this, and you can see them, right? It's plain as day. Most of this, like this bottom corner, you can stand here and you can look up 30 feet and see the stones that Herod put in. And that is still the original corner, and there's a bunch of other stuff that's original. Top is not. Anyway, so this is the city of David. He, Solomon expanded north, Mount Moriah, leveled it off, built a temple up there, and... And then I'll just show you this one last thing here. And, and so this is, this is in Jerusalem also. There's a, there's a re-creation, re reconstruction of what the city of Jerusalem would look like. And here you see the city of David, the Ophel, which is also Milo. Is, I don't know if it, a lot of people think it's the same thing. But anyway, expanded this way and then Mount Moriah on up from there. Okay. Gihon Springs. Water supply, uh, interesting things. There. Any questions on that? Those pictures make their way back up here. Oh. All right. If you'd like to look at some more pictures, you can do that. Other than that, I am going to stop there. We'll pick up with uh, Solomon's Prayer for Wisdom next, to, uh, next Monday. To, uh, next Monday. To, uh, next Monday. To, uh, next Monday. To, uh, next Monday.